Today's guest is Rick Rule. He has managed many billion dollars in finance and investment across the board from banks to mining stocks. He's one of the most notorious, successful, and well-known mining stock commodities, gold, silver investors that is living today. And he's going to help you make sense of what's happening right now in the world, in the stock market, in the economy, and more importantly, how to prepare and position yourself to create the most financial independence and freedom. So before we drop into today's episode, just want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Vizsla Silver, one of our favorite silver and gold mining stocks. So thank you, Vizsla Silver. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you give us a comment down below. This is Rick Rule Rules right there down below. Smash the like button and maybe share this with someone. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening and Rick's going to help us make sense of it. And I'm sure someone else could use the uh, wise words as well. So Rick, good to see you. Jake, always a pleasure to be interviewed by you. Thank you for having me back on. Yeah, so I've been talking to my friends a lot and people have been asking like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And people are like, are they going to keep raising interest rates? Are we going to go into a global depression? Are they raising interest rates purely so they can lower them again? How far away are we from that? We have midterms coming up. What's what's going on? Well, I think the answer to all those, all, all those questions, all the above is yes. Uh, they're going to keep raising them as long as they can get away with it, which they should. Uh, it would be better to have a free market in interest rates, uh, but we won't have that. They will keep raising them as long as they can. If for no other reason, uh, then they can have a fiscal tool to use it when they really need it. You can't lower interest rates below zero, <laughs> and interest rates were approaching zero before they allowed them to rise. Uh, I think, too, that we will experience some form of recession. Whether it's an ugly recession or a less ugly recession is up for debate. But from my point of view, uh, let me rephrase that. From my experience, you always end a period of expansion with a recession. There always has to be a reset. There always has to be a reckoning. Uh, whether it will be a so-called soft landing or a hard landing, I suspect, depends on who you are and how you're impacted. The joke is that uh, you know a recession is when your neighbor loses his job. The depression is when you lose your job. <laughs> and so everybody will experience this sort of thing personally. But it, I think it would be very difficult to get out of the period of excess that we've had without some fact, some form of reset. And, and I think that might happen irrespective of interest rates. But I suspect that uh, higher interest rates uh, will be the catalyst, which pushes at least some markets into recession. You said what they should do is raise rates, but let's talk about should versus your best probabilities and your experience from what they will do, would, will do versus uh, should. And we're headed into uh, midterms here coming pretty soon. It seems like every day there's like stock market uh, apocalypse talk. There's a lot of talk and a lot of early data about um, the housing market from raising these rates. Uh, do you think they course correct before the midterms? Uh, if purely to, uh, you know, it seems to be something that all regimes like to do heading into elections, or do they just let this thing keep unwinding and unwinding until something really bad happens, then they shift course? That's the $64 trillion question, Jake. Uh, I think relative to everybody's expectation, uh, the economy is in better shape uh, than many people anticipated. Uh, the unemployment rate is relatively low, albeit the labor force participation rate is at record lows. Uh, but uh, across the country, you see help wanted signs. People are having difficulty sustaining the standard of living to which they would like to be accustomed within. Uh, their existing in, uh, income levels, but that's always been true. My suspicion is that people are taking note of inflation. People are angry about the price of the pump, but so far the political class has been able to blame Putin and uh, <laughs> other extraneous factors uh, on various crises that I would suggest our own political class has been the cause of. But make no mistake, uh, we live in a society that has been a, become addicted to debt. Uh, we live in a society that has become addicted to spending more than they earn, a society that is, in fact, I would argue, eating its seed corn. And there will be a reckoning. 
Uh, how soon we'll have a reckoning depends on how high interest rates are allowed to go. Will the political class uh, chicken out uh, when the pain on the voters and the taxpayers becomes too extreme? I suspect that will be the case. Uh, I don't know when. But Jake, uh, let's play a mind game just for fun. Let's do a little bit of arithmetic. I think we've done this on your show before, but it beats, it, it, it uh, bears repeating. Uh, traditionally, that is to say, over the last 40 years, the interest rate on the U.S. 10-year Treasury uh, has had a positive yield uh, over the CPI-stated rate of inflation. The CPI-stated rate of inflation is, what, 8.6 now? And the 10-year Treasury yields 3.3, 3.4. If we returned to mean, the interest on the 10-year Treasury would be some number like 9. Imagine the impact on federal, state, and local budgets if their interest payments tripled. Uh, now, let's make it a little more personal. Traditionally, the interest rate on 30-year fixed mortgages has been higher than the 10-year treasury. Imagine if people buying a home, rather than paying 4.6 or 4.7, were suddenly paying 9.5 or 10. Uh, imagine what that would do to home sales. Imagine what, what that would do to housing starts. Imagine what that would do to first-time buyers' affordability. So uh, a circumstance where interest rates return to the 40-year mean, I think, would, at least in the near term, uh, wreak real hardship uh, on a lot of people uh, who vote. And I'm not sure that the political class has the will to take the repercussions. We've seen this before, Jake. Maybe you weren't. I mean, maybe you were too young to be cognizant of it, but we came out of the period of inflation and I would argue hyperinflation in the 1970s uh, with the American public resolved to do something about inflation. The political will existed and the social will in certain circumstances existed for Paul Volcker to raise the interest rate on the U.S. 10-year treasury over time from 5.5 to 15.6. Uh, and that ushered in an ugly recession, late 81, all the way through 1984, we saw a circumstance where unemployment was in the double digits. Millions of people lost their homes to foreclosure. Millions of people had to postpone the purchase of consumer durables like automobiles. But it worked. Uh, we set in place, as a consequence of, of that, uh, an economic climate where interest rates could fall and where the perception of inflation went to inflation heaven. Uh, do we have the will to live within our means? Do we have the will to end the war on savers by spenders? I don't know. But we're going to find out, and we're going to find out in fairly short order. Yeah, I don't think we do. I The consequences, of course, if they continued for a lot of things, you know, most people saving for retirement, the majority of their retirements in their home equity or their 401k, I mean, you've got, you'd have a lot of It'd be a very different world if they let interest rates even go to 10%. But now you're seeing the Democrats who are obviously aware of how atrocious their, their approval ratings and the polls are heading into midterms. You've seen, I've seen Elizabeth Warren a couple of times. She's like, the recession's on your hands if you don't stop. And uh, Biden, of course, and his administration are saying it's Putin's price hike. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of videos of people walking around asking people that, and people don't seem to believe it, irrespective of if they're in the country or the inner city. And uh, one other interesting thing is while Biden's been saying that, Jerome Powell, uh, when they had a, a media for the Federal Reserve, he was asked about Putin's price hike. And he said, uh, no, uh, inflation was, you know, very bad before then. And he essentially dismissed it at the same time that the administration is espousing it. Um, I thought that was interesting. Did you catch that? And what do you think about that dynamic? Um, is that a facade, an appearance that they're fighting it? Um, but that's an interesting separation, isn't it? Jake, I have to admit, uh, I don't pay very much attention to popular media. Truth be known, I have a television set now after 35 years of not having one, but I still don't know how to turn it on. Uh, and if I did turn it on, the idea that I would spend a lot of time listening to Donald Trump or Jerome Powell uh, or um, 
I guess it's Joe Biden. What about Elizabeth Warren? Would you spend? <laughs> you know, not unless I was in need of a good laugh. Um, <laughs> it's it's strange you that made the me best... spit my drink up when you said that. That was funny. <laughs> you know, it's strange when the best political commentator uh, on popular media media I think is Russell Brand, a comedian. Uh, who at least acknowledges that he's a comedian. So I would listen to Elizabeth Warren if I wanted some ironic humor. I, I realize that it's not her intention to be an ironic humorist, but I would listen to her if I wanted a good laugh. Um, but, you know, the circumstance is a bit serious for laughter. Certainly in the midterms, the Democrats will call it Trump's inflation. Uh, or they'll call it Putin's inflation. And certainly the Republicans will call it Biden's inflation. The truth is that the big thinkers uh, going back 20 years from both parties and from around the world uh, have been the authors of this circumstance. Uh, and they've done, I think, a wonderful job, actually, uh, inexplicably good job of explaining it away uh, in a fashion that at least their supporters, at least the people who believe that they have benefited from the respective policies of the Democrats or Republicans, seem paradoxically to agree with. <laughs> I don't agree with any of it. Uh, so as I say, I listen to it occasionally, either out of horrid fascination uh, or in an attempt to sort of ascertain what sort of absurdity they're going to subject me to next. But I never look at it with regards to getting information uh, or fact or, or anything particularly useful from those exchanges. So speaking of useful, uh, I mean, are you buying right now? Do you expect more chaos before they turn course? Uh, what, how aggressive, I know last time we talked, you were pretty excited. I mean, how aggressive uh, I, are you I, with your money and how much are you waiting, expecting a little bit more turmoil? My gut feeling is the market goes lower. Uh, my gut feeling is we have a couple of uh, surprises that aren't good ones, but I'm allocating anyway. Uh, sometimes things get cheap enough. Uh, you and I had a discussion, Jake, of my failure to buy Exxon when it got kicked out of the Dow 30 uh, and how that was a one-time event. Uh, and I waited to buy Exxon for it to go lower. Uh, sometimes things are cheap enough. Uh, and we're in a circumstance today where there are a few stocks that have passed uh, every level of greed I have. Uh, and although I think they may go lower, uh, I know enough about them that I would welcome their going lower. Uh, but I don't feel it would be responsible of me not to buy them uh, when I see them at bargain basement levels. Okay. Wow. Well, that's good to know. All right. So, uh, Rick's buying, maybe his crystal ball is waiting at the same time. What do we need to know and do? These are such bizarre times. Um, one difference between the Volcker age and, and now, or things you've lived through your career now is the debt is so big. Um, there's so much more social, political, and economic, uh, instability, um, how does someone prepare? What are the best mindset strategies, tools that someone needs to financially succeed right now? Well, the first thing is a realization that we will all be punished. Uh, and the extent to which you will be punished is really a function of your own prudence. The, the second thing that people need to understand is that there's no right answer. There's a series of probabilities. So if you're waiting for some guru with a crystal ball to tell you how it's going to be, uh, you're going to be waiting forever. But the third truth, the optimistic truth, is that we're all going to get through this. <laughs> we're going to get some scars, <laughs> but we're all going to get through this. Uh, what I have learned is irrespective of what sort of evil specter is in front of you, uh, somehow we survive. I remember in the 1970s explaining some of the trepidation that I had about the global economy, nuclear weapons, inflation, the war in Vietnam, all those things to my grandfather and, you know, sort of a, you know, a, a pessimistic viewpoint. And I remember my grandfather looking at me and said, you know, my generation had some challenges too. You might have heard of them, the Great Depression, World War II. <laughs> we all face these. 
uh, and we all get through them. Uh, the question is, how do you get through them as well as you possibly can? And we've talked about uh, how to do that on your show in the past, Jake. Uh, you must be disciplined. You must not be emotional about these things. You must understand that there are no correct answers. There are a series of probabilities. Uh, and you have to address all of the probabilities. You have to do it from your own viewpoint. I think you need to maintain liquidity. Uh, now, for me, an important part of my own liquidity is in physical gold and silver bullion. But I also have lots and lots and lots of U.S. dollars. I know it's contradictory. I have those dollars, even knowing that their purchasing power is declining and declining rapidly. But I have them because if we have a crisis in confidence, if we have a liquidity crisis, that liquidity will give me the ability to take advantage of the circumstance rather than being taken advantage of. Balancing that cautious stance, if there is uh, an opportunity where, based on your own knowledge, particularly if your knowledge you think is better than most people's knowledge in that, own, in, in, in that particular topic, I think that you need to go ahead and invest, and you need to invest in the long term. You need to be comfortable enough with the investment. And this is a tough test, Jake. You need to uh, follow the Warren Buffett maxim, which is to say you shouldn't buy one share of a stock if you wouldn't be delighted to see it fall 30% in price so that you could buy more later at the same price, having expended the intellectual capital necessary to invest your physical capital. I know that's hard to do, uh, but uh, Having the ability to do it uh, is one of the best determinants of success that there is. If you have little enough faith in the investment that you're making, that is to say, if you have little enough study involved, that having bought the stock, you wouldn't be delighted to see it go lower so that you could buy more. You don't know enough to buy it in the first place. Uh, I have been engaged in buying a stock. I'd prefer not to na name the name because I don't want any competition in the market. Uh, I've been buying that stock in the $2 Canadian level. Nothing would make me happier than to see that stock fall to $1.40. Uh, I have been buying reasonable amounts of that stock uh, in the $2 level, and I would be buying that stock wholesale <laughs> in the $1.20 or $1.30 or level. Would I feel bad about the stock that I bought for $2? Not at all, because I think the stock is worth Four dollars and fifty cents, or five dollars. Okay, so here's one thing that I wonder. <clears throat> I think a lot of people don't realize, like how you know you're you're really you've been really 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 successful. Uh, you're not quite as successful as Google, which falsely claims you're a billionaire, but you've managed many billions of dollars. You helped build Sprout into 23, 24 billion dollar. Um, you've made many, probably, I, I would imagine, billions if you count all the money for clients and stuff you've managed. You've done in incredibly well. You've built it. You've become a top 1% at something. Um, take us back to when you were really becoming successful and building it. What was your mindset like? What was your day like? How many hours a day were you reading, uh, for instance? I was a voracious reader. Uh, beginning when I was sort of eight, nine, ten years old, uh, and that's continued until today. Uh, left to my own devices, I'd probably be an hour and a half or two hour a day reader now. Uh, my work life in my early 20s was obscene, uh, it was stupid, uh, it was actually counterproductive. Uh, I was probably uh, no kidding a 14 or 15 hour a day worker, um, which was stupid, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I, why, I don't, I why, don't wish was, why was it stupid? Sorry to cut you off, but why was it stupid? Uh, I think I should have recognized at the time that I needed to learn how to work smarter and not hard. One of my business strategies was that if I was competing against people who worked eight hours a day and I was working 14 hours a day, that on a cumulative and compounded basis, there is no way that they could keep up with me. If they were working, uh, let's say, you know, 1,200 or 1,300 hours a year, including, you know, vacations and 
the weekends and stuff like that, and I was working 22 or 2300 hours a year, that never mind how far ahead of them I'd be after year one. Uh, after year 10, because the advantage is cumulative and compounding, uh, that I'd be way ahead. Uh, what I should have understood is that there are other aspects of life which are important. And I should have focused uh, on my in my uh, earlier years, in the 1970s, I should have focused on working smart more than working hard. Working hard, to be sure. But I should have been focused more on working smart. I tried to get ahead, if you will, on brute strength and ignorance. Uh, in fact, I did that, but I should have left out the ignorance. So what's an example of how someone can work smarter versus harder? Well, disciplining yourself, I think, is very important. Uh, too many people uh, wait to act until they have what they think is a perfect answer. There's no perfection. Uh, perfection is a form of procrastination. Uh, you look across the landscape and you try to figure out a circumstance where the probabilities are overwhelmingly on your side. Uh, you try, I think, to take risks that you can afford to take if you think that the reward justifies the risk. But the most important investment that you can make in terms of your happiness and in terms of your Fiscal, not physical, but fiscal well-being, I think is investing in yourself. Uh, find something that you really, really, really like doing. If you are competing against somebody who is doing as little of something as they can uh, to make enough money to sustain their lifestyle, uh, and you wake up in the morning thinking about it and go to bed at night thinking about it, if you really enjoy what you're doing, you are going to do it well. And the way that you make money uh, is by providing utility for other people. Uh, what really turned my life around in terms of making money was deciding not to worry about making money anymore, but rather thinking about making myself relevant uh, and delivering as much value as I possibly could to my clients. And Jake, honestly, I've told you this before, when I stopped worrying about making money and I started worrying about delivering utility and out competing my competitors, Within 90 days, there was an enormous perceptible increase in my income. <laughs> in other words, by, stop, by stopping worrying about money per se, I started making lots and lots and lots of money. And that's a very important lesson. I would say the third thing is that there's a, a, an illusory sense that there are shortcuts. You can somehow get rich quick. Uh, the long road is the shortcut. Uh, people uh, speculate because they've heard stories of stocks that go tenfold over a long weekend. Um, yeah, it happens once a decade. That is the way you get rich. You get rich through compounding, and compounding requires time. And as soon as you begin to abandon the got a hunch, bet a bunch, capture the tooth fairy sort of phenomenon around speculation, and understand that you're investing in probabilities, hopefully in a contrarian fashion, and you're investing over time so that compounding will work for you. As soon as you do that, your investment performance begins to increase markedly. Wow, that was that was good. Um, what's an example or a way you go from while you're working, focusing on money to not focusing on it? Um, but still well, working. Let's look at your own life, Jake. Uh, enough about me. You've been hugely successful. Uh, you've been hugely successful because you're a hardworking interviewer and a perceptive interviewer. What you need to do is focus on what aspect in your, in your self-help and financial channels will be of the greatest benefit to your subscribers over time. Don't worry about Will a sponsor pay me $5,000 or $6,000? Don't even think about it. Worry about taking your subscriber count up and worry about becoming indispensable to your subscribers. If you worry about delivering benefit to your community, your community will find a way to reward you. <laughs> Believe me, uh, they'll find a way to reward you. If you're a stockbroker, stop worried about your commissions. Just don't worry about it. 
uh, start worrying about educating your customers uh, as to how to receive information from you well and giving them good uh, information. Don't worry about this month's gross. Worry about your performance relative to other financial advisors and think about your wealth in the five-year time frame, time frame, not in the five-day time frame. Work hard on your job and you'll make a living. Work hard on yourself and you'll make a fortune, right? It's like that That's it. Brown quote. That's absolutely it. That's absolutely it. This was a really good interview. Um, it's really, uh, I could I could keep going, but I thought it was so great. So I, I want to uh, wrap it up there. So, so you listening can have a lot to, to digest and apply. Let us know in the comments what you learn. One big idea. Love to hear from it. Smash the like button. I'm going to toss it over to you, Rick. I know you review uh, people's natural resource portfolios for free and anything else I missed. I got all things, all kinds of things to talk about. Uh, as you suggest, if your listeners care about specifics around investing in natural resource investing, I invite them to go to a website, ruleinvestmentmedia.com. List your natural resource stocks there. Uh, I will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. And I'll comment on individual issues where I think that my comments might have some value. Uh, two, uh, if you are interested in what I'm doing with my own money and private placements, and if you are a accredited investor, in the comments section, write placements. And I will tell you within the limits of the law uh, what placements I'm doing uh, and how you might be able to participate. Uh, in addition, Jake, as you know, I'm celebrating retirement by uh, starting a bank. Any of your listeners who are unhappy with their current banking relationships, I suspect that's every single one of them, uh, who would like to know about a client-facing bank are invited in the comment section to write bank. Finally, uh, for 30 years, I've been in the investor education business, often through seminars. We're doing the 28th Natural Resources Investment Symposium, July 26th to 29th in Boca Raton, Florida. I humbly suggest that this will be easily the best natural resources investment conference of the year. Uh, and any of your uh, listeners who would like more information about it can, in the comments section, write uh, conference. Note that I'm comfortable enough about this conference that like every other educational product I've ever done in my life, anybody who believes that they didn't get their tuitions worth out of it all they have to do is ask for a refund, and they'll get a 100% no questions asked refund. So ruleinvestmentmedia.com, rankings, bank, placement, conference. Beautiful. We want to thank you for listening today. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe. Bell notification is what notifies you for new episodes. So double check to hit the bell notification. Let us know in the comments what you think of today's episode. And I uh, want to thank you for coming on today, Rick. Jake, always a pleasure. Continued success.